I just sing better when I stand next to Matt. There's just something about being back there with him. I, just, I know I'm not a good singer, but I feel better when I sing around him because he's got such a, such a great voice. This is uh, Happy Independence Day today, no doubt, clearly. Um, happy Independence Day for what we celebrate is <clears throat> this country celebrates um, our independence and our choosing to be a, a free, self-governing body. But I can also say Happy Independence Day times... Times two, uh, there's actually uh, a second Independence Day that we can celebrate this day as well. Um, I think we can officially say Mike Ayers isn't here for me to, to confirm for sure, but I believe July 1, uh, Pleasant Chapel Community Church is now um, disaffiliated fully from the United Methodist Church. So here we are. We're out here flapping in the wind on our own as an independent uh, church. So Happy Independence Day to you in those regards as well. But, you know, becoming an independent church, has, it's forced us to, you know, I think kind of stop and think a little bit about what it is we are as a, as a church, uh, what it is we, bef- we believe in, how we define ourselves, what it is that we're really all about, what it is we really ought to be doing as a church, and, and what it is that we say we believe. Uh, those are important um, requirements I think we have to do since we've kind of stopped and shifted and, and uh, turned the ship, if you will, just a little bit. Because many of those things uh, were already established for us because we were part of the United Methodist denomination and some of those important doctrinal statements and, and, and the way we function as a church organizationally, those, those kinds of things were, <clears throat> were already done for us and we, we really didn't have to do those. So, so we're in this process of uh, of clarifying some of those things for us locally uh, because we, we don't have that advantage of being able to just be dovetailed along with procedures and beliefs and polity and all those kinds of things uh, that were already done for us. <clears throat> and no doubt it's going to take a lot of time and, and energy and commitment to do that, but I, I really believe that this process can really be a very positive thing, uh, you know, especially for the ones that are have the magnifying glass out and looking at the texts and, 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 the, and, the, and the verbiage and, and, the, and the policies and those kinds of things. I think it's very good for, for them. But in general, I think it's really good for all of us as well, for a whole church, for us, you know, as we take this time to develop what it is we say we believe in in our, in our bylaws and clearly have time to talk about these things, to, to discuss. And just so you know, what is going to be established will be you know, probably in the fall, a vote that will be a congregational vote that we'll, we'll have time to look at all these things and to, and to talk about them and to, and to see what it is that we are saying as Pleasant Chapel uh, Community Church. But I think it's just a great opportunity for each of us to kind of personally engage in those things that we say that we believe in. I think it's a growing opportunity for all of us. So uh, it, it's my hope here to take the next several Sundays to kind of begin to walk us through some of the key elements of, of the things that we say that, that, that we believe in. Some of this, uh, no doubt, is, is old school stuff. You, you know it for sure. But I think as we go over them, I think it's just good to refresh what it is that we believe as followers of Christ in, in a Christian church, that we take this time to do some things like just to learn a little bit about what it is that we that we say we believe in, and what is the, what's the scriptural basis for that? You, you know, if we make this statement, why, where, where does that come from? And so that's one of the goals that I, that I want to uh, hopefully accomplish here in the next few weeks. And I think, too, another goal is I think it, this will provide you individually with some, some possible growth steps in your faith walk. I, I hope there's some things that you bump up against and say, hmm, never really knew that. I never really knew that that was part of our church. And that causes you to, to, to stretch yourself uh, in your thinking and in your, and in your faith as well. And I think as we go through these things, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause us to, to grow. And then the third thing I thought, gosh, you know, what a, what a neat opportunity for this community. Uh, you know, there hasn't been really a new church in this area in how long? You know, when's the last new church popped up in, in, in a five-mile radius of where we are right now? Really, no. There really hasn't been one. And this really is kind of like that. This really is kind of a new church that's starting. And I think there's an opportunity for those people in, in our community to say, hey, you know, they're kind of starting things new over there. I'd kind of like to know about that. And I think this might be a time 
And so that's my plug for you all to maybe think about. Maybe you've got some people in your, in your circle of connections that you know, might, be, might be a neat time to come check out, check out the church because we're kind of looking at some of the foundational things of what it is we believe in. And it might just be an opportunity to help share Christ with others by inviting them to church. So as I have been kind of walking through this, this process and thinking about, you know, the, the bylaws in general, but more specifically kind of what I work on are the belief statements and more of the, the, the doctrinal kind of, kind of things. One of, the, one of the things that, and things we know, you know, we, we, we've known a lot of these things for a long time, but as you, as you think about them once again, you know, I see that there's a, there's a very exclusive nature to our faith and that's kind of a that's kind of a four-letter word really when you think about we're we're exclusive but we're also we're also very inclusive about our our faith and if i can unpack that just for you a little bit some of the foundational things that we'll get to here over the next several weeks these statements that we make really rubs against culture and it's in contradiction which with a lot of the rest of the world would say you know, we live in a, a time where we're supposed to be tolerant to, to everything. And I think what, what we have here foundationally is, is some things that really aren't tolerant. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's, di- that's difficult. We make claims that are very exclusive. Let me throw a few of them at you, and I think they're on your screen as well. We make this claim from Scripture that says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul in Romans writes this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ. All sinned. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those are foundational, scripturally based statements that are center to, to our faith. And they are inherently rejecting other claims that other, other people and other faith systems would make. Other claim systems would say that salvation can come other ways. Well, that's not what we claim. Other belief systems would say people really aren't sinners. They're basically, they're basically good. Jesus isn't the way. He was just a good teacher, a good prophet. You know, he's not the way to the Father. So in that way, our faith system, what we believe in as a church, it, is, it really is exclusive and it really is in, intolerant, isn't it? When, when you think of it that way. And that's, you know, that's not real popular today. And so when we think about that, that's, that's something we bump up against. How, how do we as a church when we make those, those kind of strong claims how is it that we commune with people that are outside that faith? How is it that we have this belief system that is exclusive, but yet live in a world that's contrary to that? But there are also statements that are very inclusive to our faith as well. The truths that we claim are really for all people, all nations, and for every culture for, for all time. Well, our faith talks to the world, not a specific group of people. You know this one, for God so loved the world, not just, not just some people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's pretty inclusive. For God so loved all of the world. Paul says here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Again, no divisions based on nationality or gender or wealth or prestige or power. We're all the same in, in Christ. So we have that initially when we begin to, to look at this, and it's kind of some strong statements that we have to learn to deal with. How is it that we stand for something that is that is strong, but yet live in a, in a world that, that just doesn't accept that. They, they want to have um, you know, multiple kinds of truths, and we don't believe in that. We believe in, in one truth. So we are working to clarify and, and profess these things that we say we believe in. 
And then how is it that we then function once we have those established? And then another question, how is it that we determine what it is we believe? (laughs) It was easy before. We had that book called The Discipline. You know, I don't know if you saw that first graphic there, but the the United Methodist Discipline is thicker than most most Bibles. And uh, that's the basis for where our, our beliefs and our bylaws and our procedures came from was that big nasty book called The Discipline. And one of the things we decided early on, the leadership decided, we, we don't want something that big. We don't, you know, anytime something gets that big, it's pretty useless. So we're looking for these statements that are, that are simple and they're concise and we can recall them. And most importantly, we can apply them and use them. And so that's what we're hoping to develop. But how, how do we go about that? How do we determine what it is that we, we ultimately believe in? The model that I have up there is kind of an adaptation of um, John Wesley, who was the founder of of Methodism back in the 18th century. He said, you know, we we come to understand God in in four ways. And he talked about Wesley's quadrilateral and four different ways that that we come come about knowing God. And I modified that just, just, just a bit. Because how we come about our understanding of what it is we say we believe in, well, clearly... Clearly, we start off with, with sacred texts, sacred codes that have been given to us, and, and we know that for, for us to be the Bible. That's our beginning point for how we understand truth. We believe that the Bible contains the authority by which we live our lives and how we govern ourselves as a people. And we also believe that it is a, a story or a narrative that helps us come to know personally our Creator. That's primarily what the Scripture does for us. It gets us in connection with, with God by coming to know Him, by encountering the Word of God in, in Scripture. It also helps us understand this history of how God's worked through, through people. And, and then as a result of that, there's been this whole set of rituals and traditions associated with the church of so many people that have come before us that has helped help develop this system of beliefs that you and I that you and I have. So many people throughout time and throughout all of the world have helped to contribute their, their thoughts and their understandings and their experiences of faith as they too have encountered Christ in their lives. So we have that. That's a key element of how we understand and how we connect with truth that comes comes from Scripture. And then also for us, we have a general understanding of who we are. And it's, that's not all, all perfectly pretty either. How is it that we understand our, our nature? What, what is the, what is, how do we understand human beings and their, and their nature? Well, Scripture tells us that we were, we were created in a very special way. All of creation was made by God by spoken word. But us... You and I are, are unique because we were made to bear His image. We are a special creation of His, and we were created for His enjoyment and for His glory. And you know that comes from the book of Genesis right away when He talks about how people were created. God created humankind, He made them in the likeness of God. Male and female, He created them, and He blessed them and named them humankind when they were created. We were created very special to bear his image, and that's part of our nature. But the dark side of that nature, too, is we know that inherent to all of our essence is this tendency to contradict our creator. We are all, you and I, and every human that has been born, created with an aspect that's not good. It's tainted by, by sin. We have this image of God, but the image is marred because we all have individual sin and we're also born into the nature of sin that affects all of of humanity. But if you are in Christ, if you have received the forgiveness found at the cross and you trust in, in Him, we're promised through Scripture that we have a new nature about us. That that old nature of flesh, the Scripture told us, is transformed into a nature that is is spirit. And it's new and it's being transformed back into the likeness that we're, that we're supposed to be. And we have this ongoing battle about us. I know I'm preaching to the choir on this because you're all human beings and we have this ongoing battle of flesh 
and of spirit. And that's where we find ourselves right now. Paul talks about this from Romans. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And so we have this ongoing conflict that we have here of who we are. We're created these special people that are to bear his image, but also that image is marred and tainted and we're being transformed back then only because of the grace of God and the spirit that dwells within us. So we have this understanding of our nature, of our human nature that helps, helps us contribute to what it is that we, that we say we believe. And then the next thing, God has given us minds. He's given us minds to reason and to think and to ponder and to wonder about the wonderful things of nature and the wonderful things of God and what he's, what he's doing with all of humankind and with all of the cosmos in general. And based on, based on how our nature is, it affects the way we think. Again, if we are people that are focused on the flesh and the carnal and the temporary, our thinking will reflect that. And we will begin thinking about things that are away from God and contrary to Him. But if we live by the Spirit, it affects our minds as well and we begin to think and understand and be back into the right kind of thought process that God would have us would have us do. Our thinking becomes enlightened. I like to use that word because that gets abused by atheists. We really do become enlightened by the one who really is light. Good thinking because of the, the spirit that is within us. Romans 12, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what God's will is. Finally, then, we come to this understanding of truth by our experience and our our feelings. This isn't something, you know, what we say we believe in is just not some static document that we say that we believe in and we put a check mark off on it. It's just some mental thing that we say we agree with. It's, It's something that's done and it's something that is experienced because within our faith we believe that we we physically have a relationship with, with God. Our faith affects the way we, we feel about all, all of life because of the experiences that we have. We get to relate to truth because truth is not a word, it's a person. We have a relationship in the one that we say we believe in. And all these things begin to work together and affect our lives, the way we function individually, and hopefully the way we function as Pleasant Chapel Community Church collectively. This passage from Philippians, if I've read it once in here, I've read it ten times probably. Paul says, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There's the renewal of the mind. Think about these things. And then he goes on and says, keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard. And then the God of peace will be with you. And I love that passage there because in there you see this process. Think about the right things first. And then put them to practice and do those. And then you feel what you're supposed to feel. The presence and the peace of God. Think. Do and feel. <laughs> so many times we do that backwards. You know, think, do, feel. It goes the other way. Feel, do, mm, think. Right? Too often we get it backwards. Fortunately, we've been given a guide to do it, to do it a better way. So that's kind of an, that's sort of how we come about what it is we say we believe in. But there are other world views that are different than ours. But they come about this in in the same kind of way. The difference we would believe is what they're going to come to is is not truth. It is an absolute truth that we believe we have in the person Christ. But they'll come to something that's that's just a philosophy or it's an ideology. For these other world views also have sacred texts. They have very important books and writings from people that they, that they trust in. They have a whole community of people that will support this belief that, that they have. They have the same common ideas about things, but they are different than what we would say are, are Christian ones. It's a different worldview. 
You know, we, we celebrate this day of independence. You, you know, we, we, we walk in the sanctuary and we pass our flag as a reminder that we live in a country that's free to do what we get to do. We have this awesome opportunity to choose so many, so many things. We get to follow our faith because we're part of a, a country that that flag lets us come into. But you know, this, this church is not an American church. You know, this country also provides the same freedom for other people to choose to believe and to act and to form their set of beliefs that are different than ours. And frankly, we allow the freedom for people to choose that which is wrong. And that really is true freedom when you think about it. But I'm glad we live here, that we have the opportunity for you and I, that we can choose what we believe is right. But that also means we live in a country where we can choose that which is wrong. And so, you know, when you think about this, this idea, these, another way of coming about what pe- other people would maybe consider is, is truth. These, these texts that we would be talking about would be written by, by people. And, and that's going to affect their understanding of how they believe the nature of, of humanity really is and, and their role of their emotions and their feelings and how they understand, understand truth. And, you know, when I make that statement, when you think about that, you know, what's he talking about? I'm a little vague here intentionally. The first thing you think about, well, clearly that's, that's other religions because those sacred texts would be things like the Koran or the, the sacred book of, of the Jewish people, the Old Testament, or it would be the writings of Confucius or, 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 or Hinduism or another religion. And then the whole communities then get built around, uh, around those kinds of faith systems based, based on those that are clearly quite different from ours. But also that I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about too, I think there are other systems of beliefs that are different than the ones that we're going to talk about here the next several weeks that are a lot more subtle. And they're right around us. At every corner, we have a dark kind of truth being, being pushed that isn't, isn't really true. A lot of it is because we live in the time that we live in. We live in a time where information is just so easily transmitted, available to uh, our fingertips based on our phones and our tablets and TVs. And so quickly and worldwide information is past, and so world views can literally be invented every day. And I think what you find is the sacred text that so many people are just getting sucked into are sacred texts that you find in social media or on a television channel or on a website or on books that are, that are published by mere philosophers. And because, because of that, you'll find, because the propagation of information and, and, and how we can move stuff around so quickly and worldwide, you find whole communities of people that will come into an agreement on, with, with a particular slant. And it is kind of a religion, if, if you'll allow me to call it that. And because information explodes, that religion can explode as well might not call it a religion, but if you think about the time and energy that we can find ourselves devoting to a particular kind of idea compared to the amount of time and energy we should be spending on things of religious faith, you got to wonder what really is our God. Those sacred texts that we find that are wrong is we'll find so many people basically claiming that humanity is basically moral. We're basically good. Another big lie that we have that's foundational in these false religions is we believe that we are the givers and determiners of life. Life is not something that's given by God. We are the ones that get to determine that. And since we are, If I'm a pregnant mother, then it's my right to be able to choose life or not. It isn't a God thing. It's a people thing. There are also ideologies that would say God does not provide you with your identity or any kind of pattern of behavior, but rather your identity is what you choose to assign to yourself. 
your behavior is based on any kind of feeling or orientation that you have. I don't need to go into that, but you know exactly what I'm talking about there. Again, that is an ideology that's very prevalent. And you can find a whole community of people that believe in that, but it is contrary to what we believe because we believe our identity and our purpose and our behavior is a gift and patterned by what God would have us be. What is our purpose here? Other ideologies would say, you know, your purpose is dictated by success or power or wealth or status instead of what we would believe as a people that our purpose is dictated by a loving God who calls us to love him back and to love other people. So my point in this, before we get into these in the next several weeks, is I think we live in a dangerous time. I think there are so many voices out there vying for your heart. And I think it is important that we be very careful about what we, what we choose to spend a lot of time in, in reading and in the websites we go to or or a particular party that we want to put all of our beliefs in. That's not to say we don't participate in those things, but, but we can be so easily deceived. Paul writes in the book of Colossians, Troy read part of this to us here, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. Boy, that's appropriate today. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you come to the fullness in him who is the head of every ruler and authority. And I think that's where we need to be. We need to be as followers of Christ, finding ourselves centered in what it is we say we believe. That needs to be primary. Where is it that we are investing most of our time and our energy and our thought It should be on the things of God. We need to be people that are spending more time in Scripture and in church and on our knees confessing and seeking His will in prayer and staying in company with other believers who will help us stay accountable to Him. And we need to be people that are loving and merciful and full of forgiveness and kindness because that's what He's commanded us to be. That needs to be center. And that needs to be first. All of those other voices that are competing for you, they're giving a, another narrative for your life and they're just wishing that you'll pay your honor and your homage to something else. And it's a false god. So again, that's why it's important, I think, that we take this time to, to really clarify these things that this church has been around a long time. The church has been around for 2,000 years. But this is an opportunity for us to go back and look at these things. And to understand a little bit more fully about what it is that we say we believe and what does that mean for us collectively. And so if I circle back around to this beginning of what we say we believe in, it's so good. What we say we believe in, yeah, it's an exclusive truth, but it is so good. Because at the very heart of this is a perfect, most holy God that we can't even look at because of our unholiness and our uncleanness. But yet he's found a way for us to be reconnected to him by way of a cross. It's so good that he's given us life and he's given us purpose and he's given us meaning to this life that we have here and now and an eternal life where we can look at him face to face as holy as he is. That's the greatness of the good news that we proclaim. So it's my prayer that you and I would use these next few weeks as we develop our independence as a church. We'll acknowledge our full dependence on His grace and His mercy, but will we use this time to individually consider deeply what it means to be His follower and what it really means to do church. Let's stand and we'll close with prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We're shortly going to leave here and we're going to go, we're going to go celebrate an independence that, that you've given this great country. Remind us once again that, that to, to fully appreciate what it is that you've given. But alongside that and in a much bigger way, this day and this day moving forward, would you re-remind us the real freedom that we find 
in your Son. By your Spirit, I pray that you would enable this church to continue on what you have started in this church. Guide and direct our hearts and our minds that that we would just be a great beacon to this community. And we praise you for the good things you do and will do in our future. Amen. Your command is to go back there and take donuts home. (laughs) And eat cupcakes and enjoy the party.